Welcome to the very first episode of Storm the Norm. I'm Narayan. I'm Anisha Motwani. And together, we will answer a whole bunch of questions about how businesses can rewire to succeed in a disruptive world. But first, let me tell you what Storm the Norm is about. We'll explore questions like, in the first place, why Storm the Norm? What is wrong with the norm? And if you do want to Storm the Norm, how do you go about doing that? These are some of the questions that we will go and explore. In the very first episode, we will talk about a big daddy norm. It's one of the oldest pieces of received wisdom. If you're too big to fail, you're probably too big to disrupt. That is a big norm, Anisha. But I want to actually ask a more fundamental question to begin with. What is a norm? Why is it so important? Let me give you a psychologist's definition of a norm. A norm is a widely accepted behavioral regularity that is supported by empirical and normative expectations. That is a mouthful. <laughs> uh, but is that only to do with individuals? What about businesses? No, let me explain it to you a little simply. Okay. Um, why is it that we brush our teeth every morning? Why okay. not after breakfast? That's interesting. Okay. Why is black a formal color? Hmm. Why... Is white the color of peace? Why not the sunshine yellow? How come these things have become norms in society? You know, for years, one have grown up saying you need to brush your teeth in the morning and I pass on the same norm to my children who also believe that they need to brush their teeth in the morning without actually questioning why should we do it in the morning? Why not do it after breakfast? I can just do saline goggles in the morning. So many millions and millions of people across societies and across categories are doing it. So it must be the right thing to do. And if you do the right thing, the normative expectations, what others think about you, also become positive. You don't have to suffer the consequences of somebody thinking you're out of the line. So that is the fundamental of why norms are very easy to get created. It will take five minutes for somebody to get normed. But storming the norm, that's a different ballgame altogether. I can see, I mean, that, that example is so illustrative of, of, of what a norm is. I can see a lot of kids probably becoming very happy if you stormed the norm and told them you don't need to brush in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I can see how it's, it's the same in organizations yes. as well. And I get the point you're making that without norms, the world would probably be one of chaos. But I also get what you're saying on the opposite side, that if there is an over-dependence on norms, then we would stagnate. Absolutely. Yeah? And yeah. that's why I storm the norm. Okay. That, now that makes sense. Now let me get to the specific norm that you spoke about, right? The big daddy norm. Uh, that if you're too big to fail, then you're probably too big to disrupt as well. And I can immediately think of examples in the Indian landscape or around the world as well, right? I mean, I think the most uh, obvious one currently is uh, Unilever facing up to the storm that Patanjali has created in their lives. And Colgate for that matter. That's right. I mean, 2% market share loss just yes. last week announced, Absolutely. right? And and now that I think about it, it's not just specific uh, companies, but whole industries, right? I mean, I think about the Kali Pili taxi, right? Who would have thought that would be disrupted? That's been the norm for decades. And then Ola said, hey, I thought about it. Or the ubiquitous Dabawalas of Bombay, um, who's going to replace them? Danzo said, I will. Yes. Right. So, yeah. And so I see that. I see that. So is it always true that it's the in, it's the incumbents who are never able to storm the norm? It always takes an outsider to come in and to disrupt. And I'll build on this. Yeah. You know, some of the best disruptions have not come out through incumbent industries or incumbent founders or incumbent teams. Banking industry, mm. you know, mutual funds. Mm. You know, I mean, some of the best financial product innovations have not been created in the in the banking environment at all. So, what is it? I mean, are you not allowed to be an Asian red pan gorilla and and still be disruptive? I mean, what's going on over here? Can we can we take a closer look at this? What's going on under the surface? Let's come to the larger organizations. Okay. okay. Too big to fail, too big to disrupt. Okay. Okay. Change is happening at three level. Okay. There is incremental change, mm. which large organizations are very good at. Yeah. Okay. There is evolutionary change and there's transformative change. 
Incremental change, I think there is meaning in the word, so we all know what incremental change Correct. is. But evolutionary change and disruptive change or transformative change, there is a bit of a difference. Mm. In an evolutionary change, you know the destination in advance. I want to move from this product and I want to create that product. I want to change this distribution model and I want to move to a Y distribution model. That's pretty clear to you. So you're evolving from point A to point B. Point okay? B is also clear. Transformative change, which is the change where you actually need to storm the norm, mm. is a lot more disruptive mm. because you don't know the end state. You're almost inventing the future. When you invent the future, that point B is not finite. But that's probably also what makes it exciting and intimidating at the same place. Absolutely. So, so what factors might hold large organizations back from, from being able to do this? Disruption comes with a set of paradoxes. Okay. There are conflicts, there are challenges, there are dilemmas. There's all kinds of ambiguity. And that, I think, is the starting point of what defines transformative change. Living in a state of tensions and dilemmas and ambiguity mm. and enjoying it and thriving in it is what large organizations struggle with. I think that's a very sharp point you're making about the conflicts and the tensions and the paradoxes. I also wonder if there's another addendum to that. And the second point being the unpredictability, which again, you started off with. Right? I mean, it's almost like if you told a large organization that... Um, Y is the 25th letter of the English alphabet. They won't believe you until you tell them what the first 24 letters are. And you need a logical, well linear line of sight to the next horizon. Uh, but that's not what disruption is about because it's about discontinuity. Yes. Uh, but whereas large organizations are about continuity. What else is going on? Innovation never has a straight line of sight to revenues. Imagine an organization mm. that is investing and betting on something mm. that does not have a line of sight to mm. revenue mm. and mm. financial economics of it all. So you want predictable short-term growth because you don't know where that innovation is going to lead to. Okay. And in, the, in this whole, uh, between the short-term and the long-term, the short-term, the immediate here, then now always takes over. Yeah, yeah. If you have to optimize, when it comes to choosing there is this whole dilemma of and, and resources are finite. You know, there are human resources, there are financial resources, and there is intellectual resources available in organization. You know, and that's the conflict and the dilemma that, we, right. that I spoke about. When you face that dilemma, the short term always succeeds over the long term. And it sounds like because of that, because of that finiteness of resources, most organizations are about managing and not innovating. You know, not anticipating and not disrupting or inventing. They're not storming the norm. Yeah. Um, so that's that's four I'm already picking out. What else is going on? There is this whole thing about idea generation is equal to innovation. Okay. That's the norm. Innovation is equal to idea generation. Actually, and that is where I think large organizations, you know, need and have a strength to 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 succeed, you know, much more than startups do. Transformation requires four stages. There is a discovery stage and there's a design stage, which is the idea generation stage where you actually create an environment where creativity thrives, where people come out with their best ideas on the table and you're constantly in a, in a stage where you're challenging each other. That's the fun part of it all. But very quickly, the idea generation stage gets over. You know, your idea can refine and improve over the, over the period of time. But you need to take a bet on one idea and move it to the next stage. And the next two stages are the development and deployment stage. And that's where large organizations have strengths. You know that they have structures. You know that they have resources. You know that they have processes. And how do you move from an incubation stage to embedding it into the core organization so that the strength of the structure and processes and resources of a large organization come into play becomes the transformative stage, you know, which becomes crucial to either innovation succeeding to a level where they actually create a, a new storm or remaining like small new business ideas that are getting incubated in a lab by a set of geeks in the organization. Mm, 
Mm. Okay, so let me try to capture those five points that you're saying hold large organizations back. The first is discomfort with conflict and contradiction. The second with unpredictability. The third, a focus on short-term growth over long-term innovation-led growth. Uh, and then there's the uh, the focus on managing versus anticipating and disrupting. And I think finally, the disconnect between idea generation or incubation and actual implementation. Absolutely. So, five clear challenges that you see come in the way of large organizations not being able to storm the norms. It seems almost like a doomsday perspective when you put it like that. that I mean, are large organizations doomed to stagnate? Can they not disrupt? Is that yeah. always the case? No, I mean, there are examples, be it the IBM, the GE, the Microsoft. Let's talk some more about that. It's true. Actually, when I think about that now, you're right. I mean, uh, all three of them, GE, IBM, and Microsoft, broke the mold because they were okay with disrupting their own established business models. GE went from a mixed bag of B2C and B2B to a pure play B2B business. Uh, IBM went from hardware to services and solutions. And Microsoft, I think, my God, they've shed so much excess baggage and gone into becoming leaders in a cloud-first world. You're right. I mean, I mean, it's not that. I if wish Nokia had done the same. Yeah. Well, they were they were the 800 pound gorilla with the room, weren't they? Yeah. I mean, yeah. Microsoft, absolutely. They were in like a license Raj business almost, right? And they've gone to becoming, uh, as of last week, uh, topping Apple in market cap as well, right? That's that's brilliant. But is is that's global? Is there somebody in India that you think we can take as an example? One story that comes to my mind, which is also part of the book, uh, is the ITC, Fiamma Devils, you know. Uh, and today they declared the results. 11% growth on such a large base. And there's one story, I mean, I'll just pick it up as an example to tell you, you know, how uh, cultures of innovation can get created in organizations. The Fiamma Devils. A soap is a soap is a soap. For years, you know, Lux, uh, Dove, all that we've seen is communication innovations, product innovations. If you read the story in the book, Fiamma Devils has actually managed to solidify a shower gel in a soap. That's brilliant. <laughs> and they were trying to create this whole solidification of, of a shower gel in a soap because the shower gels are ahead of the time in India. Indians, you know, unless and until they've scrubbed themselves, sat down on a stool and scrubbed themselves, they don't feel that they've bathed well, you know, and that they have been cleansed enough. So they do need the soap and shower gels consume a lot of water and there is an, in India a water shortage. So ahead of the time, they knew they could never scale it up with a shower gel. So the soap was required, but the recipe of shower gel was, was very well appreciated. So they looked at solidifying it and the technology that they borrowed came from Paole, the 25 Pesa candy. And, and that's what they used as a tech to solidify that. And today that category is such a humongously successful category for them and innovation in soap. Yeah, and I'm lost in thought because I'm thinking, you know, like you pointed out with Dove or with Lux, uh, the industry examples are littered with either communication innovations, as you call them, or, you know, we've all grown up listening to the sachet, sachetization of a lot of FMCG products. I mean, the pack packaging innovations. Incremental but, change. Exactly. But truly uh, innovative products are very rare to come by. And I think that's a great example now that I think about it, it sounds like everything that ITC has done to move away from a focus on tobacco-led growth to FMCG-led growth uh, or other business diversification has to do with business model innovation or product innovation. Yes. Um, At least a lot of them do. Yeah, and and I think the if I if I had to reinforce one other point that you just said, it is to look outside of their own business and then say it doesn't matter. It's a twenty-five paisa hard-boiled candy. That's where our innovation is going to come from. Uh, I think that again uh, takes uh, takes takes some bravery to go out and and think and perseverance. It took yeah. them five years to finally get there. And I think that's the old cliche, isn't it? It it takes years to create an overnight success. So yeah, innovation, <laughs> yeah, innovation is not about overnight success. It takes time. It takes perseverance. It takes looking Sweat. outside. It takes all of that, right? Okay, so now I'm trying to 
you know, we identified five factors that might hold large organizations back. But can you talk about, can you distill some of the learnings from, say, the ITC example and say what might be the factors that can actually help large organizations storm the norm? This whole culture of exploration versus exploitation. Okay. Creativity versus control. Hmm. Okay. For me, that's the first point. And maybe... Connected to that possibly is uh, you put aside an experimentation budget. Um, you know, every organization doesn't always commit to that experimentation, that innovation by saying, okay, here's a budget actually to do it. I mean, in the old days, maybe it was called an R&D budget, but R&D resulted in incremental change. Here we're talking about experimentation. Experimentation and, you know, exploration budget. Link, uh, where one would link non-financial performance to company's budget. With rolling targets probably because you know innovation never happens in a year. It could roll over. It could happen earlier. It could happen later. And it sounds like that's linked to another uh, core part of large organizations' DNA, which if I may call it, it's uh, process paralysis, right? <laughs> Getting too much into detail, too much deliberation. They need to shed that excess. Too yeah. many meetings in the boardroom. Too many meetings in the boardroom. <laughs> too that's many right. PowerPoints. Yeah, yeah. So how do you get from there to what to chase? There's another thing that that is coming to my mind as we speak. This whole thing of, you know, do you choose between the best idea or the best agreed idea? That's okay. interesting. Normally what organizations, large organizations do, and I've been part of that system for so many years, an idea liked by maximum number of people mm. is the best agreed idea. Mm. Sometimes I think that the more disruptive the idea, the more difficult you find takers for it. Okay. You will always find a, correla- a, a kind of an inverse correlation between a good idea and the number of takers for it. Okay. Because it, it makes you a little squirmish. You have to get out of your comfort zone uh, to accept something that is truly, truly wild and crazy. So what happens is you settle between on to the best agreed idea and not necessarily with the best idea. Yeah. Having said that, there's somebody who needs to spot the spark in the idea. And then there is an alignment process. Because if you have not aligned the rest of the team, especially the core team, you will not be able to take your idea forward. That's also important because, you know, an idea needs to thrive in a collective after a certain point in time. That's a super important point. Alignment, not necessarily consensus, but also alignment after you've got the best ideas on the table, not to get to the best agreed ideas. That seems like, you know, the the first part of incubation plus implementation. And I I see another important factor that dovetails into this nicely, and which is something that large organizations try try to foster. It's, It's trust. Right. Um, Trust is actually necessary for collaboration. And without collaboration, you will not have an innovative idea take off. It it will never see the implementation phase. But it seems like trust is not just that, right? There's something else going on. You know, at the core of trust is continuity and consistency. Okay. And at the core of storming the norm is discontinuity and disruption. So at one level, it does seem oxymoronic. Yeah. You know, the trust needs empirical evidence to, to support right. it. Trust comes with norms. Right. Okay. Storming the norm, on the other hand, comes without any empirical evidence. It's some amorphous idea at a certain stage. And you are asking me to place my trust in it. And that requires a kind of a trust that only, you know, a mother's love kind of a trust. You know? <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, that's a really interesting parallel. And I can just see that happening, especially at a personal level. Right? I mean, you think about disruption as a mother throwing up her little baby in the air and the baby gurgling with joy, content and trusting in his mother to catch him when he comes back down to earth. And that's actually the biggest asset that a large organization can have because you've built that legacy of trust. Now trust yourself enough to throw the baby up in the air because you know you will catch it yeah, when it comes back to ground. You have the structure, you have the resources, you have the teams, you know, you have, you know, all that it goes to take it from an idea stage to a, to a stage where it can create a new storm, which becomes a norm uh, for the others to follow. So trust is kind of like the trampoline 
uh, of the norm that you can then leap off from and say, here's a new place that I'm discovering because of that. That's a really interesting insight. And, and I'm going to try and connect the dots back all with the five points that you spoke about, right? So fostering a culture of exploration, but bring that into ground reality by setting aside an experimentation budget. Because uh, if you don't commit to it, you're not going to actually do anything with that culture. Um, number three, shed the excess baggage. Don't get lost in the details. Number four, don't strive for consensus, especially not when you don't have ideas. Go after the best ideas, then create alignment, not necessarily consensus. And last, use trust in a way that you don't normally see organizations using it. So how would you want to sum this up, uh, Narayan? You know, what's our hashtag STN1? <laughs> hashtag yes so actually too big to fail can actually be your biggest advantage to create disruption and rewire for success if you can use all of these above factors and above all the trust within the organization to leverage change instead of seeing change as an intimidating challenge that is to be mitigated then you will be well on your way to storming the norm well said yeah. So thank you for listening and look out for newer episodes every fortnight. And you can find and share all episodes by just searching for the Storm the Norm podcast with Anisha and Narayan. Mm-hmm.